Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Are you ready for eternity? Can you face Jesus, the King of Kings, upon His return? Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Go with me to Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? A question being asked here, because obviously uh, the Israel of the Old Testament uh, was aware that there was a Messiah coming. Uh, they were aware that uh, God had made some promises about uh, the power and the ability of Israel to populate the earth and, and to be a chosen uh, people unto the Lord uh, uh, God. And so it was that he's saying, Who, who's believed it? We've talked about it for a long time, but uh, nobody seems to believe it. Well, and so he says, To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, we can answer that real quickly because from the beginning of God's dealing with Abraham, uh, he revealed the arm of God was stretched out to the people of Abraham and that uh, uh, they were to be blessed and honored uh, by the people of God. And so it was that when that took place and, and they thought, oh, well, that'll be happening real quick. Well, it doesn't happen as quick as they thought. And so there's lots of questioning going on in the hearts of the Israel people. Now going from that thought to verse 2, we find these words. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now we understand that uh, people in the old natural form of this body uh, have a tendency to uh, look at things in a different way than what they really are. And so Isaiah is saying, you're looking for the wrong thing. And Israel had it in their mind that this was going to be a glorious king that suddenly just appeared and uh, everything was quite okay. But God had a different plan. And so Isaiah is called upon God to go to Israel and to tell them what was going to take place. So I go back to verse 2. And he starts out, he'll grow up before him as a tender plant. In other words, he's going to come as a child. He's going to be born naturally. He's going to grow up uh, before Almighty God as a tender plant. In other words, he's going to have a childhood. He's going to have a teenage span. He's going to have young adulthood. And God is going to develop him and minister unto him as the time goes by. And so he goes on, Isaiah speaking, he has no form or comeliness. That means that he doesn't have any special position. He doesn't come already recognized by one of the kings of earth or by a new king of the earth. He comes, as it were, according to his earthly heritage. A babe born in Bethlehem, we know the story today. They didn't know that in Isaiah's day. And we know he was born in a manger. We know that uh, uh, he uh, grew up and had to flee for his life as his parents discovered that they were trying to kill him. All the kings of the world didn't want to see another king. And so they were against him, and they began to come and ask questions and so forth. And so Isaiah says, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he doesn't come in robes of royalty. He doesn't come in a, a, some kind of a chariot and a horses with a fancy harness on them. He comes as a little babe, like any other child, was born into this world, and now we find that there's no way to identify him. 
in the realm in which Israel was evaluating his appearance. Verse 3, Isaiah goes on and he declares, he's despised and rejected by men. Oh, well here they've been looking for a king that comes marching in. He's going to be powerful, probably have an entourage behind him, in front of him, and it's going to be a big splash and a lot of stuff going on celebrating this new king that's going to take over the world. Well, didn't quite come that way. He was looked upon as a very common person. Uh, he didn't have anything special about him. He was known as the child of Joseph and uh, Mary. And as a result, he had no special uh, attention paid to him. The Bible says in the uh, second line, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He really did not have a very good childhood. Uh, once uh, he was old enough to travel, you'll recall that uh, uh, God sent uh, Mary and, and Joseph into Egypt uh, with the babe so that he wouldn't be destroyed by those that were coming to look upon him, knowing that he was going to be the king of Israel, but they didn't know how or when. And so it was, he has no former communist, no special position, no special uh, awareness, uh, and no one to be looked upon as real important. He just sort of blended in with all the rest of the kids, except for one thing. He was always running for his life as Mary and Joseph moved from place to place to keep him safe. Going on, he was despised and we did not esteem him. In other words, he had no special value, just another kid growing up. Now verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now Isaiah is taking them uh, in his prophecy uh, from childhood to adulthood. Uh, we know the story about him going to uh, the temple for uh, the ceremony that uh, was required of the Israelites and at the age of 12, and uh, that's recorded in another place. But we do find that uh, Isaiah now is saying uh, uh, he's the one that uh, we don't have any uh, appearance of glory in seeing. Uh, he seems like just an ordinary young man, but uh, uh, he has borne our griefs. Well, how did he bear our griefs? Because uh, he hadn't yet been on the cross of Calvary. But God, in the beginning, determined that he would come and he would set the captives free who had fallen into the bondage of the law of sin and death caused by Adam when he sinned against God. Now, as a result, they had no way of knowing uh, who he was. Uh, or how he was, but Isaiah now is saying, this young man that you have ignored and not paid any attention to has already died in the mind of the Heavenly Father for our sin, for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. In other words, he already took uh, the whipping, the, the correction of of God that we had coming before he was to die on the cross for us. He had not yet done it, but when God said it was going to happen and God sent him as the uh, only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God, that was literally created by God in Mary's womb, and all of those things took place in such a, a normal way to the a natural eye of mankind in that day, we find that he now is going on and saying he's already doomed, or should we say committed, uh, to pay the price. Now, he had a will of his own, and we need to understand that. In the area of humanity, and uh, as we go from there, we find now that uh, in verse 4, that uh, Isaiah is changing the subject. And he's talking to Israel and he's saying 
This is the man that is already destined to pay the price for our sin, and he's taken our sins upon him, he's taken our grief upon him, he's taken our rebellion upon him, and he is considered worthless by us, but oh, he's the most valued creation that God ever gave to humankind. And so in verse 5 we go on, we learn some more. Verse 5, I use this often when I'm praying for the sick. He was wounded for our transgressions. Our transgressions were disobedience. Those things where we knew what was right, but we did the wrong thing anyway. We transgressed. We violated the orders of God and did our own thing, in other words. And it says he was uh, bruised for our iniquities. Our iniquities. Our ungodliness. Our thoughts and activities and lusts and all of the things that happen uh, to us as we uh, go through this natural life on this earth. And then it talks about the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Well, that chastisement is the corrective uh, element, application, of violated uh, and sinful activity and uh, as a result, uh, uh, we've all known what chastisement is. Uh, you did wrong, I did wrong. And the first thing, I, I can remember the first thing that I heard in my house uh, when I was pretty small, you just wait till your father gets home. And, uh, oh, what am I going to wait for when my father gets home? Well, when my father got home, I found out that my mother... Uh, went into great detail about what I had done, how I had offended her, whatever, how I was wrong, and uh, now you're supposed to pour out your wrath upon him. Give him a spanking or do whatever, but correct that child. That's chastisement. He refused to do pretty much what my mother told him to do, and as a result, I generally didn't get near the chastisement that was wished upon me, but all the time between my dad being working uh, out in the field or the uh, timber somewhere, and uh, when he would get home for the day, uh, there was sort of an agonizing time that went on in my spirit. Why? Because I didn't know what he was going to do to me. My mother indicated that he's probably going to beat me half to death. And uh, come to think of it, I don't think I ever remember my father taking a switch to me. I do remember my mother doing it very often. But that was chastisement. That was paying for the peace that I would have that, well, that punishment is over with and I can go on about my business and not be afraid any longer. So, we find that Jesus became our chastisement for our peace. So that we could come into a place where we could come before the Father, and coming before the Father not be afraid of what the Father was going to do in punishing us. Jesus took that for us. And I think we need to stop and think about the real importance of the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God that was made to be slaughtered for your sin and mine and all that goes with that carnal time of life on this earth. Verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. Yes, when we transgressed, when we knew we were doing wrong, even though we knew what right was, we violated, we transgressed, we broke the rules that we knew very well and was not uh, in any way surprised by what they were and what they meant. And so he was bruised for our iniquities 
and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, he took the whipping, he took the dressing down by uh, whoever was in charge of us, and sometimes it was my mom, sometimes it was my dad. I could always handle what my dad did a lot better than I could what my mom did. And that may not be the case in your life, but that happened to be the way I had to face life in my young age. And so I walked in a situation where I was constantly being chastised for what I didn't even know I had done was wrong. So, and then it tells us uh, that uh, by his stripes we were healed. And uh, we know all about that. Punishment was harsh in those days. Punishment still is harsh today, I suppose, but not nearly as severe as it once was. And so as we consider these things, we need to thank God that he sent Jesus to give us a freedom from the guilt, condemnation, punishment, chastisement, rebuke, rejection, all the stuff that comes because we didn't measure up to some other person's idea of what we should be. And Jesus came and he said, I'll take my stripes, I'll take them and I'll bear what goes to my uh, brothers and sisters, but I will bear their punishment. And so it tells us uh, that uh, indeed by his stripes we are healed. How are we healed? Well, we're healed in a lot of ways. We think of it perhaps mostly in a line of uh, physical, physical punishment, physical healing. Uh, and we think of it as being healed of disease, being healed of injuries, being healed of uh, all kinds of accidents perhaps, uh, being healed from a failure to understand a situation and uh, making the wrong decision. Uh, lots of ways of being healed. But he healed us spiritually. He healed us emotionally. He healed us physically. He healed us mentally. And his stripes were given so that whatever came our way came because uh, uh, Jesus paid the price for us. And we, I think when we take communion and we use these verses sometimes that we don't really stop and consider what Jesus really did for us. And he didn't have a good childhood. He didn't have a good adulthood, young adulthood. Uh, and we find out some more things about him as we go on. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I want to just divert for a moment on that. Uh, I'm dealing with a situation where there are quite a few people who believe that Jesus died on the cross as God, as the Lord. But if that's the case, how is it that the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all? A little hard to believe, isn't it? And so, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generations? But yet he had a multitude to inherit it. When we stop and understand that he was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. Why? Because he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he was going to the whipping post and to the slaughtering death of the cross for you and for me. 
and millions upon millions of people down through the generations of time that have turned to him and said, Yes, Lord, I know you're my Redeemer. I know you brought me out of the bondage of love, sin, and death. I know that you healed me from the terrible wounds that the old ungodly elements of the powers of hell pushed upon me. And I know that you were given unto me as a sacrificial lamb who died on the cross of Calvary, and the Lord has put on you my sin, my guilt, my failures, my pain, my ignorance and stupidity, everything about me that was not wholesome, you have paid the price for my healing. And as we go on in verse 7, it says he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Now those of you who have not been around livestock or around sheep especially, uh, you'll discover that uh, uh, the, the sheep are unique and different in many, many ways. First of all, uh, when time of fear comes, uh, instead of running, most often they will just freeze where they are. Well, how many times do we just freeze when we realize what we've done? We don't know how to get out of it. We don't know how to undo it, can't undo it, and on and on we go. And so now we find that he didn't open his mouth as he was led to the slaughterhouse. Did the sheep know he was going to be slaughtered? Oh, I think he did. I think they knew. I'm talking about the natural sheep. I think they know when they're taken in to be sheared. And uh, I think that uh, they know uh, when there is fear uh, that comes upon them and it sort of paralyzes them and they become an easy target for whatever is going to destroy them or harm or hurt them in some way or another. Okay, so he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent. Uh, when I was a young boy we had a few sheep on the little old farm that we had. And I remember my dad when uh, uh, their wool would get heavy and thick, uh, having prepared for the cold of the winter, uh, that uh, in the spring uh, he would uh, bring them in and he would pick them up by all fours uh, under the belly and, and pick them up and uh, hold their feet and lay them down on their side. And uh, he didn't have to tie them down just laid him there, and as he laid him on their side, he'd put his hand on one area and the shears on the other, and he would take the, the wool off of them, and they were just quiet, didn't struggle. Uh, it was like they knew that was what they were there for, and uh, it was okay. Well, Jesus is the same way when he comes in our behalf. He knows that he paid the price for us. He knows that there's nothing to struggle about because the price has been paid. He knows, he knows, he knows. So, verse 7, the last sentence says, He opened not his mouth. Now go with me into verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? He doesn't have any descendants. He won't be married. For he was cut off from the land of the living. In other words, when Jesus really had come into full maturity as a man, he was hung on the cross. He was tied to the whipping post. And he paid the ultimate price. For all who will believe upon him, he died that they might live. That means you and me and millions and millions of people down through the ages behind us and those that will in the ages to come should the Lord tarry and not return for his bride. The way things are going today, I have a feeling that the Lord could come almost at any time. But it's one of those things that 
Only God knows. Okay, verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence. He was any, nor was any deceit in his mouth. They made his grave with the wicked, the ungodly. He died and was put in the tomb that was made for somebody else. But by that, even though he was put in the grave of the wicked, he was rich at his death because he had done no violence. He had no sin. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. And you'll remember on that, what we call Easter Sunday morning, the women came to anoint his body with oil, give him proper burial. He wasn't there. Why? Because the grave couldn't hold him. He was without sin. The jaws of death had no power upon him. And as a result of his godly, holy, holy, pure life, not one sin, not one deceit, not one imperfection in his character ever was charged against him. So the law of sin and death had no power over him. The reason you and I are pointed wants to die is because we have inherited sin from the time of conception. Jesus had no sin because God created his spirit in the womb of Mary. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord, now here again, the Lord is the word of God. We call him the second part of the Trinity. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. To bruise who? To bruise Jesus. The Lord has put him to grief. For who? For all of us that were born in sin. Inherited it from Adam who failed God miserably when he didn't need to. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So he had no natural offspring here on this earth. But oh, what a reaping of glorious bride who he has purged and cleansed, delivered and set free, uh, brought to a place of perfection, and imparted his righteousness unto us. That's a glorious, beautiful thing. And as we live in his righteousness, then we are his bride-to-be with his return to take over this old world and rule and reign it for a thousand years. We're going to rule and reign with him over the nations of the world. That brings up a lot of questions I can't answer, but I can tell you, I know it's going to be true. We have evidence in the Word of God, and so we need to understand. Anytime we delved into the Word of God in Isaiah chapter 53, we are learning the price that Jesus paid. And the Lord put our sin upon Jesus the man. Not Jesus God, not Jesus the Lord. The Lord put our sin upon the man, Jesus. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. I know I read that, I'm stressing it again. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, 
he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. That means my manservant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities, their sin, their imperfection, their ungodliness, their lusts and all the things that are not impure. He bears those. Verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death. Jesus became a living soul because God put in Mary the seed of conception that knew no sin. In Adam he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. When he sinned, that soul became dormant, dead. We still have it. But it needs to be renewed, and I talked about that, I think, last week. It's important for us to take seriously being born again. And I covered that. I don't need to go into it now again. He was numbered with the transgressors. Oh, they hung him on the cross with two thieves and murderers, whatever, on each side of him. And he was given the crucifixion death that was the ultimate death they gave to those who had done such egregious sin and awful death uh, brought forth at the hand of their wickedness that they were put on the cross. Others would be uh, uh, whipped or would be uh, brought to death in some other way perhaps. But this was a situation that was special. And so Therefore, he was the manservant, and God says, the Lord says, he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. Yes, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now, because he poured out his soul unto death. Jesus the man had a soul. Just like you and I. The difference was, he chose not to enter into the temptations of this world, where we are born with the temptations already present within our very being. So he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the soul of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Now, that means he took our sin our guilt, everything that was impure about us. He took it, he hung it on the cross of Calvary, and he became our literal judgment for sin, the judgment that belonged to us, but he paid the price because we chose to accept him when he approached and said, I want you to serve me. Will you serve me? All those who believe upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Remember? Now, I want to take you to a portion of Scripture in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. There are a lot of you out there who have the attitude that, well, I was baptized when I was a baby. That's all that matters. Well, that's a lie. It's not true. There are others of you who say, well, I know that Jesus was born of a virgin, and I know that he was the Son of God, miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit into Mary. I know that. And yes, I believe that. And I know that he died on the cross for my sin. Yes, I believe that. But... Because I believe it, I can go ahead and live any way I want to live. I don't have to change my way of living. 
That's why Jesus said, and it was Jesus' words, and it's Jesus' words that the multitudes today laugh and snicker at when we talk about being a born-again Christian or a born-again believer. They mock, and they're going to pay the price of eternal damnation and judgment. But here's the situation. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, that's the gift of Jesus Christ, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit that performed the action of erasing the sin that Jesus bought and paid for at the cross, and have tasted the good word of God, and so they knew that, and they believed that, and they accepted it, but then uh, the enemy comes along and says, oh, you're okay, you don't have to change the way you live. Uh, I mean, after all, the Bible says, whosoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. Well, there's a lot of conditions that go with that that the enemy don't tell you about, and you better get out of the idea that you don't have to really be converted. You, in order to be born again, that dormant soul spirit in you, it has to be changed. It has to go through a new birth process. And in that, the Holy Spirit rejuvenates it, re, uh, it empowers it, and re, uh, causes it to become righteous and without sin. And God no longer remembers the sin against us that we committed before we were converted. So, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now listen, if you have believed that Jesus died for your sin and that he paid the price for your ungodly deeds and for your carnal needs, if you believe that, you better believe the rest of it because it says uh, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. In other words, they, we have tasted of the word of God, the purity of God's word, and we have seen the powers of the age to come. We've seen the miracle working hand of God. We've seen the dead raised, we've seen the sick healed, we've seen those uh, uh, come back to life that are obviously were dead, and uh, it tells us that yes, Jesus paid the price for it all. If they fall away, if you're one of those who say, well I believe that I was saved, but I didn't change my lifestyle, or I did for a little while and then I went back to my sin because I didn't think it mattered anymore. Here's what it says. If you fall away, you cannot be renewed to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open Shame. The Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Jesus the man. He wasn't the Lord. He was Jesus the man. Just as Adam was Adam the man. With a pure soul, untouched by any sin or any impure element of any kind. And yet in a moment's notice, in a moment without notice perhaps, he eats of the tree that God told him not to have anything to do with. And so I'm going to ask you what you're going to do with Jesus. What are you going to do with him? What have you done with him already? Have you turned away from him and gone back into your filthy sin and live in sin now and call yourself a Christian? 
The Bible says if you fall away from the righteousness that God gave you and the illustration of His power that He revealed to you and extended to you and gave you the ability to assume in your life to exercise that power to the benefit of others to the glory of God, if you fall away from that, the Bible says, you cannot be renewed unto repentance. Since you crucify again, you yourself crucify again the only begotten Son of God. And you have put him to open shame. You've heard the saying, it would have been better for that person had they never been born than to be born and go through life as they've gone through life in rejection of the love of God, the obedience of a man, Jesus the Christ, all for you and me who were so corrupt at the moment of conception that we could not, we could not live beyond sin. Because, you see, there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And that shedding of blood is the blood shed by the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God, who knew no sin or evil. And so, beloved, with that, it's time for us to go into communion. Just a moment. I'm going to go to Luke again, chapter uh, 22, and we'll begin reading with verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 16, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now as we take of this little chip of bread, broken from its loaf, representing the flesh that was ripped from the back of our Lord Jesus Christ, for all of our earthly needs, our carnal needs, here on this earth. He said, this is my covenant with you. So let us eat with sobriety of thought and emotion and recognize the privilege we have of eating this bread representing the price our Lord paid in our behalf. Let us eat together. Now as we take of the cup, it represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put it into the sand, Golgotha's Hill. As we look at it, let us be reminded that he poured out his blood that you and I might be salvaged 
brought back from the jaws of sin. Remember Jesus when he went into the depth of the earth, pits of hell, after being raised from the dead, came forth with the long sin conquered. He holds the keys of the law of sin and death. When we meet the standard to live by that, we are purged and cleansed, sealed with the testament of Jesus' blood, represented by what is in this little glass, the juice of the vine. With those thoughts, let us give the Lord praise and glory for being faithful unto the Father, unto the Lord, until he had done his work for you and for me. Let us drink together. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at Gene with a G-E-N-E. Gene at ChristianLiving101.org.